So, um, <laughs> okay. Okay, good. Okay, so uh, let's start on lecture two of the course. Uh, you folks all know the drill by now. The slides are on the website that I told you about yesterday. And there are a certain number of figures today which I'll refer to which are on those slides. And there'll be some caricature of them on the blackboard. So in the last lecture, I told you a lot about electron-positron annihilation experiments. We talked about E plus E minus to two fermions. We talked about uh, the study of the Z boson and the W boson that was carried out at LEP and SLC in the 1990s. Eventually, we want to get to the understanding of what physics is like at the LHC. And for that, we need to understand one more important thing, which is how to deal with a hadronic final state, a proton-proton or a proton-antiproton collision. Now, electrons are elementary particles. So we can just put an electron in the final state and compute anything we want to know about it. A proton, of course, is not an elementary particle. It's a bound state of three quarks, some number of gluons, some number of extra quarks and antiquarks. The wave function is determined by the soft, strongly interacting part of QCD. It's rather complicated. And it would be good not to have to actually compute the proton wave function exactly in order to make predictions for physics at the LHC. Now, fortunately, there is a way around this, which is called the parton model. And so that's what I wanted to talk to you about today. To introduce the parton model, I think it's easier to go halfway from E plus E minus to proton-proton collisions, which is, there's some small furry animal running around in the front row. <laughs> Uh, okay, ah, okay, a large furry animal. <laughs> okay, um, so it's, the easiest way is to go halfway from an E plus E minus initial state to a proton-proton initial state, which is to talk about an electron-proton initial state. And originally, the experiments of this type were done with a fixed target um, set up. So you have some material, you have a high energy electron beam, you shoot the beam at the material and you see what happens. And of course in the modern age, uh, we're now talking about again the 1990s and early 2000s. Um, this process was studied in a colliding beam setting at the collider called HERA that was located at DAISY in Hamburg, Germany. So we'll talk about all those things. Um, what I'd like, the way I'd like to start out, though, is to make some general remarks about this process and its structure as viewed by the early experiments. So let's first draw some kind of uh, diagram for the structure. We have an electron. It scatters. There's a proton over here, which is going to have momentum capital P. The electron emits a virtual photon that hits the proton, and stuff comes out, hadronic stuff. And what we'd like to do is to analyze this process. There are a lot of observables in this process because the incoming electron, of course, comes from an accelerator, so we know what momentum it has. And the momentum of the final electron can be measured. I'm going to call that K prime. Then the momentum transfer to the proton, so this is in lowest order in quantum electrodynamics, is known. Uh, Q is equal to K minus K prime. And so many of the other kinematic invariants associated with this process are also known. So let's make a little list of them. First of all, the momentum transfer, Q is a space-like vector because it's momentum emitted by an electron to a final electron. So this is usually written minus Q squared, 
Q squared is some positive number. Next, the center of mass energy for this process, the square of that is S. I'm going to, when I write the kinematics, make approximations that are good for high energy. So I'm going to ignore both the mass of the electron and the mass of the proton. For the early experiments, the energies were, well, maybe I should say the momentum transfers were of the order of a GeV. So one couldn't really ignore the mass of the proton. But just to make things easy, I'm going to do that in this lecture. So the center uh, 2k dot p. Then um, we can also ask what the total mass of the hadronic final state is. So that's a quantity w squared, um, which is uh, p plus q squared, which is uh, 2 p dot q minus q squared in the notation I'm developing. Then, um, if you think of this in a fixed target setting, we can ask what is the fraction of the electron's momentum that's transferred to the hadronic final system? And that is a ratio which is called y, which is uh, q0 divided by k0, which in the proton rest frame we can also write as 2q dot p over 2k dot p, because in this frame p is just m000. And that's now in terms of invariance, and we can boost that to any frame we want. And finally, there's one more invariant which is very useful. It's a quantity called x, which is just the ratio of the two terms here, q squared over 2p dot q. And with everything that I've written, you can see that q squared is equal to x times y times s. Now, w squared is positive, and so x is a quantity that's between 0 and 1. And this energy fraction is also between 0 and 1. So very conveniently, we have two Lorentz invariantly defined variables that live between 0 and 1 that characterize the general kinematics of this process. The process can be inelastic. You can have a large number of pions plus a proton or a neutron that come out of it. Okay, so people did these experiments. And what did the results look like? Well, in the 1960s, the right thing to do was to plot everything in, as a function of W, because W would be a hadronic mass and people at that time were very interested in hadron spectroscopy. And what you found was that the first thing that happened was you produced hadronic resonances. So as a function of W, you have delta resonance and various other resonances, and you get a shape for the cross-section, d sigma dW, that looks something like that. However, what people found is that as you increase Q squared, these resonances all blurred together. And instead, you had some broad structure that looked like this with maybe I should say little ripples on it where the resonances were. And the actual data from the famous SLAC MIT experiment of the 1960s is shown in figure one. So you can see what this really looks like. OK, well, how do you make sense of this? Well, of course, in the 1960s, people struggled to make sense of it. But now that we understand the standard model, we have a lot of hindsight. And we can apply that to try and guess what the answer ought to look like. So we have a proton. And the proton has some quarks in it. And probably it has some gluons in it. And then, as I say, there might be other quarks and antiquarks. And these quarks, antiquarks, and gluons are all exchanging momenta and interacting through QCD forces. However, what we know about QCD is that QCD doesn't like to have hard interactions, interactions with large momentum exchange. So typically, if there's a large momentum exchange, a gluon must be transferred. It's proportional to alpha s of the large momentum. And if the momentum is much larger than a GeV, that alpha s is small, and such excursions can be described in perturbation theory. 
So if we, for the moment, forget about perturbation theory and just think about the soft dynamics, all of these particles are interacting with momentum transfers much less than a GeV. If I were to boost the proton, then what I would have are constituents with momenta that are almost parallel to the momentum vector of the proton. And so, actually Feynman made the observation that one could try to model this system by writing each constituent I as in a boosted proton as having some fraction of the proton's momentum and just using that as an approximation to the structure of the proton. So this is something called the parton model. where what we'll do is to say that each constituent i has some probability, which I'm going to call fi of c, where c is a number between 0 and 1. This probability, fi of c d c, of existing in the proton wave function. So we have our highly boosted proton with momentum p, and inside there are constituents i called partons, with momentum C times F I of, sorry, momentum C times P, and the probability of finding such a parton is F I of C times C. And the F I's are called the parton distribution functions, or PDFs. Okay. So what I'd like to do is now apply this model to compute the cross-section for the process that I've written here. Um, this computation may not be good for small values of Q squared, that is Q squared of order the interproton forces, but it should be good when Q squared becomes large, when one quark or gluon, uh, of course with electrodynamics it's always a quark or an antiquark, gets struck out of the proton with a momentum transfer much larger than one GeV. So let's now try and do that computation. In the parton model, what this looks like, instead of that diagram over there, is the following. Maybe I should draw it over here because we'll come back to this. The electron comes in with momentum k and goes out with momentum k prime. A momentum q is transferred. The, the virtual photon strikes a quark in the proton with momentum Cp. So this final momentum over here is Q plus Cp. And the other pieces of the proton come out like that. And so this blob here represents the proton wave function, which we're going to try and represent in terms of these PDFs. And so now what I'd like to do is to turn this diagram into an actual calculation of the cross-section. Okay, well, the only thing that's hard now is that here there's an actual Feynman diagram, and we'd like to get the cross-section associated with that Feynman diagram. So that's not so hard, because we did all the hard work in the previous lecture. So I'd just like to remind you that in the previous lecture, we studied electrodynamic interactions with the virtual photon in the S channel. So for example, we got a result like this. When E plus E minus annihilates to mu plus mu minus with a left-handed electron here and a left-handed muon, the amplitude was equal to E squared times one plus cosine theta. Now, it's useful to write this in terms of kinematic invariance. So let's write this as four E squared times U over S. Let's just remember that for a two-body reaction of massless particles, there are three kinematic invariants, S, T, and U. S, if the momentum here is P is 4P squared. 
t is minus 2 p squared times 1 minus cosine theta, and u is minus 2 p squared times 1 plus cosine theta. So the sum of these things add up to 0 for massless particles. So just looking at these two lines, oh, please excuse me. Uh, yeah, I should get this right. We can immediately make this identification. Okay, well now, um, if we want this process in another channel, all we have to do is affect crossing. So for example, if I cross the positron into the final state, and the mu plus into the initial state, I get this process. And that crossing gives us a matrix element 2 e squared. The um, s becomes a t, and the u, you can check, becomes an s. Finally, if I do the other crossing, namely cross this guy into the final state, and this guy into the initial state, I get 2 e squared u squared u over t. It's interesting that u, as you see from these formulae, vanishes in the backward direction. And actually, it's pretty easy to see by angular momentum that it has to happen for that process. If I collide a left-handed electron with a right-handed fermion, the angular momentum looks like this. If I scatter backwards with helicity conservation, the angular momentum looks like this, and so the process violates angular momentum. And so this amplitude has to have a zero in the backward direction, which indeed it does. So now, um, we're, it's just excellent. We can write down the cross sections for these two reactions, because there's the matrix element. We just have to decorate it with the right kinematic factors. And the answer is, um, d sigma d cosine theta is pi alpha squared over 2s times, let me try desperately to get all the factors right, uh, s squared over t squared for um, left-handed particle scattering and u squared over t squared for a left-handed particle scattering on a right-handed particle. And you can see from the diagrams, it doesn't matter whether it's a mu minus or a mu plus at this order of perturbation theory. You get the same expression. Actually, it can be any kind of massless fermion, including a quark. If I have a quark, I need to supply in this formula a factor of the q squared, the charge of the quark, and that's the only difference. Okay, and then finally, I have the polarization average. Um, pi alpha squared over s, s squared plus u squared over t squared. And there we are. Okay. Well, now we're in excellent shape because now we've computed the basic cross-section in this diagram, we've decided that we're going to model the proton as an array of partons with these initial momenta. And so now we just have to put everything together and write the complete cross-section for this process. So that would be the following. We have to integrate over C with the, um, oh, maybe I should also say, um, among the constituents of the proton, there are quarks, antiquarks, and gluons. The gluons are not electrically charged, so they don't participate. The antiquarks and the quarks, it's basically the same story. So let me just assume there are quarks for the moment for simplicity. We'll put the antiquarks in when we're done. So then I can write the integral dc 
the sum over quark flavors, the parton distribution function for each quark, the charge of the quark, and that cross section over there. And I've introduced the notation hat. So when I have a, an overall process, I'm going to use S. For the subprocess that involves the partons, the kinematic invariants will be labeled by little hats. And so that's actually the complete parton model expression for this cross section. Um, the only problem is that it's not obvious that Xi or any of these things with hats are actually observable. So we have to do a little work to try and figure out how we're going to actually test this prediction. Now fortunately, it turns out that a lot of these kinematic invariants are observable. So first of all, um, S hat is equal to um, the little p, the parton momentum, to p dot k, which is equal to c times s. Similarly, u hat is 2 p dot k prime, which is equal to 2 p dot k minus q, which is equal to, um, please excuse me, there's a c to turn that into a p. Uh, this is, this quantity here is going to be S. This quantity here is the one that I had previously defined as Y times S. So this is C times 1 minus Y times S. And T hat is equal to just the momentum transfer, which is Q squared, which is minus Q squared. So actually, we've identified all of the kinematic invariants in terms of things that are actually measurable in the reaction as it takes place in an experimental hall. Well, there's one exception, which is C. We need to know what C is. But for this, there's a very beautiful observation that was made by Feynman in his original analysis of this process. If you look at the scattering process over here, you see that the final quark has momentum Q plus Cp. But on the other hand, we're treating all of these quarks as massless, or masses so small we can ignore them. And that means that this is 2 C P dot Q minus Q squared equals 0, or C is equal to 2 over p dot q, which is the quantity I had previously defined as x. So x is measurable because both of these quantities here are measurable from the original experimental situation. And so this is a very cool observation. You measure q squared, you measure little q, you form the variable x, and within the parton model, that gives you the momentum fraction of the quark that was struck by the virtual photon in that particular reaction. And now, basically, there's just a little cleanup that we have to do. Um, oh, please excuse me. Uh, from this formula, dt dt hat is equal to minus 1 half s hat d cosine theta. So, oh, please excuse me. This, is, this formula here I should have written is, it's a d sigma d cosine theta. So I can replace that with dt, which is the same thing as dq squared. And what we end up with in the end is this expression. Uh, sigma d sigma d q squared, and the dc I can now replace by dx is equal to the sum over f, qf squared, the parton distributions of quarks as a function of x. We can put the antiquarks back now. Um, 
2 pi alpha squared over q squared squared. Now just substituting for the t squared that appears here. The numerator, as you see, is 1 plus 1 minus y squared. And we're all set. And now, if you like, I can use that formula that I wrote before. Um, Q squared is equal to x, y, s to turn this into an integral dy. And now I've really got this formula captured in a very succinct form. So d sigma dx dy is equal to uh, the sum over flavors, the quark and anti-quark distribution functions, um, There is a factor of s hat that comes, please excuse me. I'm going too fast for my own good, but everything is actually correct in the notes. Ah, yes, when we came here, there was a factor of s that I can turn into um, x and 1 over s hat. And then there is a qf squared. And then there's a 2 pi alpha squared over q squared squared. Um, we're all set, and one, one plus one minus y squared. And yes, excellent. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Yes, there's an S that should go here. OK. This is a very cool result. We've split prediction for the cross-section into two pieces. One piece is pure QED, the simple QED cross-section for electron quark, electron elementary fermion scattering. The other piece is purely proton structure. So this is F2 of X is the name given to this structure times a QED cross-section. So amazingly, this quantity in principle should be an arbitrary function of x and y, but in fact it totally factorizes in these two variables, x over here and y and q squared over there. This has a prediction, which is that if I just take the data, which is given here, and divide it by the QED cross-section, this should be only a function of x, and it should fall onto a single curve in the, um, in the cross-section versus x plane. And when people did this experiment, uh, again, uh, a slack MIT group in the 1960s, um, they actually knew about this prediction. Uh, one of my colleagues, Bjork Kane, realized even before Feynman's analysis that this should take place in a sufficiently simple model of the strong interactions. So he encouraged them to plot up the data in this way. And the result you'll see in figure two. And it's amazing, it really works. All of the complicated dependence that you saw in figure one, when you treat it in this way, falls onto a simple function of x when you plot it in terms of x, f2. And that simple function of x has an interpretation in terms of the shape of the proton wave function given by the PDFs for the various quarks. So now we've made a huge amount of progress. First of all, we have a model for the proton structure which is very tangible. It involves only this one variable x or c. We have some idea of the inputs which if you had to compute them, 
would actually require a full calculation using the soft part, soft and non-perturbative part of QCD. And in principle, we could extend this prescription to any other kind of process which involves a proton in the initial state and a large momentum transfer. The main thing we need to know is what are the values of these PDFs? And as you see, once you've done the electron-proton scattering experiment, you actually get some information about that. So what I'd like to do next is to, as it were, guess the values of the PDFs and draw some shapes for you. Um, the actual values of the PDFs extracted from experiment, I think I'd like to defer that because there's some, something more that we need to know about QCD before we talk about how to really extract these PDFs from data very accurately. But at least at this stage, we can think about the proton, get some idea about what these PDFs look like, and then try and apply that to other processes. So let's talk a little about the constraints on the PDFs and the shape of them. So first of all, we can think about the PDFs for the up and down quarks, which are the primary constituents of the proton. The proton's quantum numbers say there's an excess over antiquarks, excuse me, of two up quarks and a down quark. So we have these sum rules, F u of x minus F u bar of x from zero to one should be equal to two. And for D, there should be an excess of one. For other flavors, there should be an excess of zero because, for example, there's no net charm in the proton. And there are probably also gluons in the proton. And so the sum of the momentum carried by all the constituents is constrained that when you add up all the momenta, you should get one. So this should be something like the sum over all flavors of f of x plus f bar of x plus the gluon distribution times x, which is the momentum fraction, should be equal to one. So under these constraints, we can try and just draw some qualitative pictures of the parton distributions of the proton and try and understand what these ought to look like. Normally, what's done for the up and down quarks is to separate them into so-called valence and C distributions. So the valence distributions describe the, um, if you like, the extra two up quarks and the extra down quark in the proton. And the C satisfies this constraint and has an equal number of quarks and antiquarks. And so let's now try and draw these, first of all, for up and down. So normally what you would expect is there's some number like a third and roughly each quark carries a third of the proton's momentum transfer. Actually, this isn't quite right. The up quarks, it turns out, carry a little more, and the down quarks, of course, of which there are only half as many, carry also a little less of the total momentum. It's something you can understand if you try and think about the quarks as it were stretched out in momentum and think about how you would push one quark to have almost all of the momentum of the proton. So it probably carries the spin of the proton and at lower momentum fraction, there would be the easiest thing to have is an I, isospin equals spin equals zero um, di quark. And so it's easier to get an up quark to carry most of the momentum of the proton than a down quark. The second thing is that in the C, you also expect some probably smaller asymmetries. Um, for example, 
if the proton resonates with a neutron and a pi plus, that's a configuration where you have u d d and u d bar at lower momentum. So it's easier to get a d bar to carry a substantial amount of the proton's momentum than a u bar. And so roughly what you would expect is that the d bars are slightly harder than the u bars. And similarly for strange quarks, there's some other kind of resonance that you can imagine. Um, if you have this kind of resonance, you might expect the strange distribution to be a little harder and the strange bar distribution to be a little softer. And maybe I should say there's evidence in the data for all of these dependencies, though uh, these two are kind of smaller effects than this one. This one has some interesting consequences, which we'll come to in just a moment. You could imagine that if you have a whole collection of high momentum transfer scattering processes, you could fit the whole data set and actually come to some quantitative estimates for what these PDFs are. So, you know, think about the things you could use. Electron proton scattering, electron deuterium or heavy nucleus scattering, which would give you some idea of the parton distribution of the neutron. Uh, neutrino scattering, which then picks out specific flavors of quarks in the proton. There's some other processes which we're, we're going to come to in a minute that also give evidence as to the nature of these parton distributions. But once again, there's another subtlety which is rather essential when you go to actually fit the data set. And that's something I'm going to talk about tomorrow. So for the moment, I'll just leave you with this kind of qualitative appreciation of what the PDFs look like. And we'll go on and then we'll come back to this tomorrow and get really the, the, the actual results. Okay, so now that we are armed with a theory of proton structure, we can start doing some calculations of cross-sections in hadron-hadron scattering that might apply to processes we can observe at the LHC. The simplest one is to, again, concentrate on leptons. And so let's think about the following reaction. PP going to a muon pair plus other stuff. So in terms of these parton diagrams, such as the one that I drew over there, this would look something like this. An incoming proton P1, an incoming proton P2. Out of this, I'm going to take a quark, let's say an up quark. Out of this, I'm going to take an anti-quark. These guys can then annihilate into a virtual photon or a virtual Z and turn into a muon pair. And then I have a muon pair that I'm producing in an, a proton-antiproton collision. So given the parton model structure, it's very easy to compute this cross-section. And let me now go through it uh, in detail for you. So the expression would look something like this, pp to mu plus mu minus plus x. In this derivation, I'm going to ignore the z, just to, to make things easy. In the previous lecture, I showed you how to put that back, and I showed you that there in e plus e minus, there would be some uh, photon z interference. So we'll talk about that at the very end of this discussion. But for the moment, let's just do the pure QED annihilation of a quark and an antiquark into a mu plus mu minus. The expression would then look like this. I need to take this guy at its momentum fraction of the proton, this guy at its momentum fraction of the proton, compute the cross-section for quark-antiquark -quark annihilation to mu plus mu minus, and sew it all together. So dx1, f, f of x1, maybe integral dx2, f, f uh, bar, of x2, 
And then I need the cross section, maybe um, d sigma d cosine theta. Probably I want to integrate over that as well. For um, q, q bar going to mu plus mu minus. So to work this out, we, we should do some kinematics, just as we did in the case of electron-proton scattering. We'd like to be able to identify what are the various momentum fractions that are appearing in any given reaction. And um, it's pretty easy to just compute that. But instead of doing that, I'm going to introduce some formalism that's going to actually be useful to us. So roughly, the mu plus mu minus pair has a total vector, q. And q we can write as e, 0, 0, p. And q squared is equal to the mass squared of the mu plus mu minus pair. Please note that I wrote 0 for the transverse momentum of the uh, muon pair. And that's actually correct at this order within the parton model. Because we're modeling the protons as containing uh, partons that are collinear with the proton velocity. So they don't have any transverse momentum. Um, where the transverse momentum comes from, we're going to talk about in the next lecture. So at this level of approximation, um, the muon pair is just somehow in the plane of the beam, backward and forward. Now, what I need to do is to write this vector as a combination of a light-like vector coming in in the positive three direction and a light-like vector coming in in the negative three direction. And it's basically trivial to do that, but nevertheless, I'm going to do a little analysis to make it even more trivial. So let me first remind you that e squared plus is equal to p squared plus m squared, where m is defined in this way. And therefore, I can write e equals m times the cosh of something, and p is equal to m times the cinch of something. And this something is called rapidity. It's one of those very useful variables that in general relativity that probably when you were an undergraduate, the professor was afraid to explain to you. But now it's absolutely necessary. And so uh, let me digress a little on this. If I boost this vector in the longitudinal direction, along the beam direction, it's going to turn into something like this, gamma e plus gamma beta p, 0, 0, gamma p plus gamma beta e. And there's nothing hard about this, but I can make it even simpler by parameterizing gamma and beta in the following way. Gamma and beta also obey this relation. Gamma squared times 1 minus beta squared is equal to 1. So I can write gamma, again, as the cosh of something, and gamma beta as the cinch of something. And if I plug these expressions and these expressions into this equation, what I find is um, m times cosh alpha cosh y plus cinch alpha cinch y, 0, 0, cosh alpha cinch y plus cinch alpha cosh y. That is to say, the boost of a vector in this form is just the cosh of y plus alpha and the cinch of y plus alpha. So in terms of the rapidity, a longitudinal boost is just a shift of the parameter. And that's just incredibly useful when you do collider physics. Because we know what the frame is of the two protons, but we don't know what the frame is of the partons. In principle, this can have a larger longitudinal momentum than this one. 
And this whole process can be boosted into the forward direction or the backward direction. <coughs> Excuse me. If we work in terms of rapidity, what you see is that however you view the event, it's just a simple shift of the description in the variable y from one of those settings to another. So this is just a very useful variable. Now, in this description, it's also now really trivial to solve the problem I had originally posed. So let's just go back and write Q is equal to M Kosh and Cinch. So this is equal to M times a half times e to the y plus e to the minus y e to the y minus e to the minus y. And now you see immediately it's the sum of two light-like vectors. And this we can identify as XP1, and this we can identify as XP2, X2P2. So once you measure M and you measure Y, that is you measure the mass and the rest frame of this vector, you immediately have in front of you the momentum fractions carried by the quark and the antiquark that annihilated in that particular event. Um, I probably should have said a long time ago, this process is called the Drellian process. And basically, um, the day after Feynman introduced the Parton model, uh, Drell and Yan said, well, let's make this application of it. Okay, so now um, we're all set. Let me just collect the formulae and write down the final answer. If we start in the center of mass frame here, so this momentum is P and this momentum is P, um, you can see that the expressions for X1 and, oh, sorry, in my notes it's E. X1 is equal to um, M over 2E E to the Y x2 is m over 2e e to the minus y. Uh, y can be positive or negative. Positive y means it's boosted in this direction. Negative y means it's boosted in that direction. 2e is the square root of s for the proton-proton reaction. And so now it's very convenient to change variables from x1, x2 over here to m squared and y in the description that I'm constructing. So let's just compute the Jacobian of that transformation. So 1 over the square root of s e to the y minus y. So this is um, m over s. The y cancels the minus y and there's some factor of 2. Okay. Good. Now insert that change of variables into here. And we get the following expression. Sigma for PP goes to mu plus mu minus plus some leftover hadrons is equal to the integral dy dm times 2m over s. So it becomes m squared. Now let's sum over all the possible flavors. 
f f of x1, f f bar of x2, where x1 and x2 are given by these expressions. Um, we also have to account the fact that the antiquark might come from the other proton. And then we have the integral d cosine theta of the uh, parton model cross-section. Actually, we know what the parton model cross-section is for annihilation. It's the thing we wrote last time, 4 thirds pi alpha squared over s hat, which is equal to m squared. And there's one more factor that you need to take into account. You have to remember that quarks have color. And so the color of this quark needs to match the color of that quark in order to make the process go. The probability of that is a third. And so there's an extra factor of a third for color that comes into this expression. And now we're done. Um, that's the cross section. Maybe I should also say that there's a relation between m squared and s hat which is x1, x2, s. And this is a very useful formula that we'll be applying a lot, not only in this, but in other processes. Okay, well, now, um, this is the QED result, but we can now do the thing that I did at the end of the last lecture, which is just to add in the Z propagator and proper photon Z interference. And then you've got the cross-section for the Drillian process in general at high energy in a hadron collider. And if you look in figure three, what you see is the prediction of this using all that information about structure functions that I'm going to tell you about tomorrow and the uh, full uh, electroweak cross-section um, compared to the data as measured by CMS. And what you see is that actually the theory and the experiment really agree extremely well. Um, maybe I should just say it's also important to include the QCD corrections, which in this uh, code called FUSE, which is used in the figure, are calculated to next to next to leading order. Um, but you see the qualitative structure agrees with what I wrote up here. The cross-section falls off with Q squared, but of course at the Z, there's an enormous resonance, which is the Z particle itself. And the slope, if you look at the slope on a log plot, there's a discontinuity across the Z, which is visible in the curve, which we saw yesterday in the E plus E minus data. And it basically reflects the nature of the photon Z interference, which is destructive below the resonance and constructive above the resonance. Okay. Well, now we've already done quite a bit. We've constructed a model which will, in principle, work for any process that involves high energy collisions of hadrons. We've shown how within that model to parametrize the non-perturbative proton structure as a set of simple functions that we can extract from experiment, the PDFs. We've then shown how to use that in order to compute at least one process with a cross-section that is actually measurable at the LHC. But let me just tell you a few more things about this Drell-Yan cross-section, and then I'll generalize it in another way. Again, if you look at this figure, you see that there's this very large resonance at the Z boson itself, and probably it would be useful to just extract that contribution, um, not only for Z, but also for W. I'll talk about the, the um, cross-section for producing a Z or a W, in a proton-proton collision. And so the next problem that we have now, this is also called the Dralyan cross-section, is PP to W or Z plus anything. The process looks like this with W and Z, 
And I just like to write down the formulae for that. And they're going to be in the same form of dx1, dx2, um, and a cross section for a q q bar annihilation to w or z. So it's very convenient then to work out what these cross sections are. They're pretty simple, and so I'd like to write them down for you. Okay, well, let's first think about W production. For example, U D bar annihilating to a W plus. The first thing we need is the matrix element. Actually, the matrix element is exactly the same one that I worked out for you yesterday. Um, I G over the square root of two, uh, the square root of two times two E, which is the same thing as the square root of S hat times um, the product of the polarization vectors, uh, the UD bar polarization vector and the W polarization vector. And it's the matrix element, so it's not squared. Okay. Um, the M squared is then uh, G squared S hat, which is the same thing as MW squared and the square of this quantity okay. and then the cross section which we need is the ud bar cross section to w which is equal to 1 over 2 s hat the integral over phase space and the square of the matrix element And then there are a couple more factors. Um, there's a factor of a third for color. It's the same factor that I explained to you in the other Drillian process. And a factor of a quarter, because of the four helicity states here, there's only one of them, namely the left-handed W against the right hand, left-handed up quark against the right-handed D bar that actually produces the W boson. Okay, now we're doing great. Now, um, the only thing that remains is to discuss this factor, which is one body phase space. <laughs> one body phase space is really easy. It's the integral over the W momentum, 2EW, times an energy momentum conserving delta function. I can write this also as the integral d4 pw times 2 pi, um, basically s minus s hat minus mw squared, p1 plus p2 squared minus mw squared, times the energy momentum conserving delta function. And then I could just carry out the integral over the delta function. And then putting all the pieces together, um, we can sum over the W polarization. So this factor turns out to be 1. Um, we end up with the following expression. Sigma U D bar is equal to pi. There's an alpha weak in it from here. Um, there's an extra pi from here. There's an... Oof, Please excuse me. Oh, just a factor of three. And that's it. And so from that, we can go back and construct the revised version of this cross section.
d sigma dy for pp to w plus is uh, pi alpha weak over 3 and w squared times the expression in terms of parton distributions, x1 f u of x1, x2 f d bar of x2, plus all the other combinations of partons that will add up to this, again with x1 and x2, given by the expressions that I had written here on the blackboard. Okay. Um, to compute the z cross-section, you just change what needs to be changed. And let me just write down the final expression for you. Pi squared alpha weak, a CW squared, a 2 appears here, as we saw when you go from Z to W. The 3 is still there. Delta of S minus MW squared. And then the QZ left plus QZ right squared. So that's just what always happened in the previous lecture when you go from Z to W. Okay, now um, we've computed these things, but probably I ought to tell you a little also about the physics of these cross-sections. Oof. Oh, I'm sorry. Please excuse me. For some reason, page 16 appears twice. That got me a little confused. Um, the W production cross-sections have some interesting asymmetries, which come from the differences in the U and D parton distributions that I told you about a little earlier in this lecture. And let's just try and understand this qualitatively. So, it's interesting to start not at the LHC, but at the previous Hadron-Hadron Collider, which uh, was built at Fermilab. It was called the Tevatron. And it was a proton-antiproton collider with a center of mass energy of 2 TeV. So from the proton, you have valence quarks. From the antiproton, you have valence antiquarks. And so the Drillian production is dominantly valence plus valence, the quarks on the antiquarks. If the up quarks are somewhat harder than the down quarks, that means that when you have an, a UD bar collision to produce a W plus, that W plus is dominantly produced in the forward direction. And so if I draw the rapidity axis here, the W plus production will be a little forward of rapidity equals zero. On the other hand, the process d u bar going to w minus will be a little just symmetrically in the backward direction. And in fact, that's what you saw at the Tevatron. More w pluses forward, more w minuses backward. And actually, on figure five, I show you the data from the CDF experiment at the Tevatron on the asymmetry between the uh, positive and negative W production as a function of rapidity. And you see this effect laid out fairly clearly. At the LHC, there's a different story. At the LHC, we have valence quarks only because we have a proton-proton collision. So this is uh, UUD here, UUD coming in from the other side, plus antiquarks that are in the C now. So if the up quarks are a little harder, that has a different effect. The the situation has to be completely symmetric around y equals zero because the same thing is coming in from both sides. 
So you can't have an excess of one kind of particle being produced forward and the other produced backward because it's a symmetrical proton-proton collision. Nevertheless, what you would expect is that the W minuses are produced with a more equal momentum distribution between the D and the D bar, whereas the W pluses are produced with a slightly more unequal distribution. Oh, and please excuse me. And there are more of these, just because there are more up quarks in the proton. So if you go out to large rapidity, actually in either direction, you should find a predominance of the W pluses. And that's what's shown in figure six. So this is the charge asymmetry, not of the Ws now, but of the leptons, which are the decay products of the Ws. Nevertheless, they reflect this physics in the W rapidity distribution. And so it's kind of interesting, even at this level, where we've hardly done any calculation uh, of any sophistication in proton-proton collisions, there are already quite interesting effects that are predicted by the parton model, which are actually also seen in the data. And so this is just kind of is the tip of the iceberg of what's out there when you begin to analyze the full complexity of LHC processes. Okay, now um, I just have a few more minutes to tell you about uh, the other relatively straightforward process to compute uh, for which to compute the cross section at the LHC, which is the uh, two jet production. So let me now uh, compare this to Drillian. So far, I, what I've talked about are processes where I take a parton from each proton and I annihilate them in an electroweak interaction to produce a lepton pair. But of course, something else that can happen is that these partons can have a QCD reaction. And for example, if they're quarks, I can have quark-quark scattering. Now, we saw in the previous lecture that if you actually ask what you see in an experiment, what you see when you have a quark that's liberated from one of these reactions with large momentum transfer, you see a stream of pions and kaons, the thing I called last time a jet. And so this parton diagram gives you the cross-section for two jet production at the LHC. The two jets, um, because the partons have zero transverse momentum, at this level of approximation, these have um, a PT of jet one equals minus the PT of jet two. So the jets are back to back in the transverse plane is the prediction of this theory. But um, of course, they can be at any boost because the momentum fractions of the two quarks or whatever I have here uh, could well be unequal. And the cross section for this process, it more or less just follows from the formula that I've already written. So let me write the formula over here. And then we'll ask what we have to know in order to evaluate this formula. So d sigma d y d s hat um, d cosine theta, I might as well put. This is the center of mass scattering angle. For p p to two jets would be the sum over all the possible uh, parton flavors. Let me write just i and j. x1 f i of x1 x2 f j of x2, 1 over s hat d sigma d cosine theta, 1 plus 2 going to 2 jets. And probably we should also, for a cross section here, add together, um, this might be a quark and a gluon, but also the case of a gluon and a quark producing the same final state. So you have to combine these in the right way. The parton distributions here are the same ones that we have before. Of course, we could also consider the possibility 
of having a gluon come out of the proton and strike a quark. So in QCD, all of these scattering processes occur. And now what we have to do is to make, basically make a table of these two body scattering cross sections, convolve them with the parton distributions, and then we get some kind of prediction for what we should see for the two jet rate at the LHC. Now, now I guess we just have the exercise of actually computing all these cross sections. But you're incredibly lucky because there's no time in this lecture to systematically compute these cross sections. So what I'm going to do is to tell you a little about them, um, quote some, I'll, I'll derive one. <laughs> I'll tell you a little about them, I'll quote some results, and I'll uh, give you a reference where you can find all of the others. So let's get started. The, the easiest one to compute is the one which is most like the simple QED processes that we've been discussing up to this time. So for example, if I have an up quark, which scatters with a gluon on a down quark. What you might imagine is that the structure of this cross section is exactly the same as that of electron muon or electron quark scattering that I discussed earlier in the lecture. And let's try and take maximum advantage of that. So I wrote before d sigma d cosine theta for electron muon unpolarized scattering is pi alpha squared over s hat times s hat plus u hat over t hat squared. And, oh, I forgot to actually write out for you. This is actually kind of a familiar expression because if I go to the forward direction, theta goes to zero, This becomes just the center of mass energy squared. And then there's two because u goes to s in the forward direction. And the denominator here is one minus cosine theta over two squared. Oh, sorry, this cancels something in here, so. And then we get the usual uh, sine to the fourth theta over two, which you folks all know is characteristic of Coulomb scattering, the scattering by just two particles of any kind through the Coulomb potential. And so we can try and understand all of these uh, QCD cross sections by just demanding that in the forward direction, what we get is Coulomb scattering through now a Coulomb gluon instead of a Coulomb photon. The main challenge for this particular process is just to get it normalized correctly. And so let me try and do that. The structure of this diagram is um, Ta of one quark times Ta of the other quark. So the color factor is given in the following way. It's um, the trace of Ta, Tb on the square of one quark line, the trace of Ta, Tb for the other quark line. If we sum over all colors, we have to actually average over the color of the quark from the left and the color of the quark from the right. And so if you evaluate this expression, you get uh, one half delta AB, one half delta AB. The sum over the delta AB gives you an eight, and so you get two ninths. So finally, we can write the cross-section for UD quark scattering as um, that expression over there times 2 ninths with alpha substituted with alpha s and nothing else changed. Okay. That one was really easy. Um, you have to work a little harder if you have identical quarks. 
because now we have two diagrams that interfere with each other. First this one, and then this one that have to be added together. So that gives the following structure. It gives 2 ninths alpha s squared over s hat, um, s squared plus u squared over t squared plus s squared plus t squared over u squared from the other diagram. And then there's an interference term, which is 2 thirds uh, s squared over tu. So gradually, as we add more complexity to the calculation, these uh, expressions are going to get a little longer, though not unmanageably so, as you'll see. OK, now what about quark-gluon scattering? Well, we can try to get a handle on that by, again, thinking about the diagram like this that corresponds to forward scattering through a Coulomb gluon. And the main thing that happens is that the quark charge here gets replaced by the gluon charge here. That is, the quark charge, which is 4 thirds in QCD, gets replaced by the gluon charge, which is 3 in QCD. So there's a factor of 9 fourths. And as you would imagine, d sigma d cosine theta is then for uh, quark gluon scattering is then, instead of what I wrote here, um, uh, 1 half pi alpha s squared. And maybe there's a 2 here, so let me just erase that. And uh, something like s squared over t squared. So from this simple analysis, you would guess something that looks like that. If you actually do the calculation and you write down the full answer, um, what it turns out to be is this. And maybe I should just say there are more diagrams. There's excuse me, this diagram and this, the Compton scattering-like diagrams. Okay. okay. Finally, um, gluon-gluon scattering. Well, now, as you see, we got a factor of 9 fourths in going from here to here. We're going to get another factor of 9 fourths when we go to gluon-gluon scattering. So we expect that d sigma d cosine theta uh, for glue glue is 9 fourths squared over s hat times s hat squared over t hat squared. And as I say, again, you have to look at the full set of diagrams. So if the one I've estimated is basically this one. There's also a U-channel diagram. There's also an S-channel diagram. And there's one more diagram that involves the four-gluon coupling. Um, if you put them all together and square the sum, what you end up with is the following expression. Nine-fourths times, excuse me, pi alpha s squared over s hat times 3 minus um, tu over s squared minus us over t squared. That's the one that gives rise to this expression, minus um, ts over u squared. And frankly, it's a pretty simple expression. Um, if you ever dip into what you have to do to actually compute these diagrams, they all collapse down to a very simple structure. Okay. Well, this has been very sketchy, but I've given you some idea, I guess, of what you have to amass in order to compute this thing we were trying to compute in this exercise.
the PP goes to two jet cross section. Now, maybe I should say that there are some nice tricks for doing these computations that I've shown here um, in a very simple and automatic way. And actually, there's a benefit that there's some extra, very surprising physics of QCD amplitudes that you can bring into it. So if you go back to the introduction and look at some lecture notes of mine, uh, which you'll find on the archive, called uh, Simplifying Multi-Jet QCD Calculation, you'll see a very, very straightforward, though maybe I should say not unsophisticated, uh, derivation of these results. And at some point, maybe not during the school, you probably want to work through it and actually um, derive all these answers for yourself. If you just want to look up these cross sections, and maybe I should say there are a bunch of others that I've omitted, um, like the clue, please excuse me, the um, UU bar to DD bar cross section and things like that, they're all listed in I think it's section 17.4 of my textbook. So you can look them up there, but frankly, if you're a theorist, you should at some point sit down with a big piece of paper and derive all of these things and feel happy about it. Okay, now, if you then make the list of all these cross sections, put them together with the part-time distributions in a computer program, and you work out what the two jet, uh, cr jet rates are at the LHC, you end up with a figure which is something like figure seven in the notes. And actually, I hope you find this interesting. Um, I've been noticing that a lot of you are printing out these uh, notes in black and white, but this is probably a figure you want to print out in color because the, the three curves underneath the total give you the contributions from glue glue, glue quark, and quark quark initial states. And if you look at the figure, what you see is that the quark quark initial state, the valence valence scatter, is actually only important at the highest momenta at the LHC. More or less, momentum transfers well above a TeV. And below that, the important processes are mainly a gluon against a valence quark, or even a gluon against a C quark and antiquark. At the smallest momenta, the gluons completely dominate. And this just, it's two effects. The fact that there are a very large number of gluons in the proton, and the fact that because of these accumulating nine-fourths, the gluon-gluon cross-sections are just a lot larger. And the physical consequences of this, I think I'm going to discuss in Lecture 4. So that's a good place to stop for today, and thank you very much for your attention. Any questions before we leave? Please. Oh, I'm sorry. Do you, you're supposed to get a microphone, but nobody's here. Oh, you're here. Okay, it's in here. Okay. So I didn't get uh, when you described the proton in terms of the PDFs. Yes. And then you said the integral of the PDF for the U should be two, for the D should be one, and for the other quarks uh, zero. That's right. You also PDF for the antiquarks when you are studying oh. the proton. Well, this is very important, so let, let me be clear about it. Naively, you would say something like this. There are two up quarks in the proton, so you'd want to write an equation like Fu of x is equal to 2. But this can't be right, because there's certainly a process where an up quark or even a down quark comes along, emits a gluon, which then turns into a UU bar pair. And this is definitely part of the proton wave function. So now I have an extra up quark in the proton, but it's compensated by an up antiquark. And so the only correct version of this equation has both the quarks and the antiquarks and a minus sign between them. Now, this equation is a little odd because as we're going to see in the next lecture, Fu of x gets extremely large at low x, and similarly Fu bar. But nevertheless, those singularities have to cancel in such a way that this integral is finite. 
But because of processes like this, we can't leave out the antiquarks. And this minus sign is very important. On the other hand, let me emphasize that in the momentum sum rule, there's a plus sign. Because both the quarks and antiquarks carry positive momentum. Okay? Other questions? Please, way up there. Excuse me, in the Drarian process, you write the PDF, the PDF part uh, in front of the cross section, and you write uh, um, F. Uh, the PDF of the of the fermion plus the uh, multi times the PDF for, of the antifermion with uh, x1 and x2, and then you you shift the two. You, you insert the plus term with uh, x1 and x2 in the different position. And That's right. Okay, and w why this? And it is always true that the two terms are equal so i can time it's, i can substitute it's, it's this not through. it's not necessarily true that the two are equal if it's two not equal to two uh, double the first term so uh, well, okay so remember the quark and the anti-quark distributions are different and so um so for so x1 and x2 are fixed if you integrate over x1 and x2, that's a different story. But remember, from the kinematics of the muon pair, we can determine what x1 and x2 are. And for example, if x1 is large, the quark distribution might be large, but the anti-quark distribution in a proton will be very small. Um, on the other hand, if x2 is small, both of these will be about equal. So these terms are not equal, and you just have to account both of them. You don't know by observing the muon pair which side the quark came from and which side the antiquark came from. Okay. Other questions? Okay, well, as you guys know, I'll be around this afternoon in the office right next to the secretary's office. So as you go through the notes, if there are things you don't understand, and I know that some of the equations today were a little rushed, um, please come by and ask me about it. I'll see you then. Thank you.